Welcome to the Deep Dive, Emerald City Hockey's Seattle Kraken podcast. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of the Deep Dive podcast. It's going to be an interesting one. Like, I don't know how fun it's going to be, RJ. We've got a lot of kind of serious topics to talk about this go around, um, but it should be, you know, an interesting time. We're going to get pretty in depth into some stuff. But first, as is becoming tradition for any podcast we do, RJ, one of us has to ask the other some form of trivia question. So for you, RJ, can you name the one team in the NHL that is maxed out contract wise? They have all 50 contracts have, are used. They have that's just where they're at. And then bonus points if you can name the two teams at 49 contracts. And while you take a moment to think about that, I'll just explain to everybody. Um, Every NHL team is allowed to have up to 50 players signed to contracts with the organization at any given time. Uh, usually they'll be in the 45 to 50 range. Usually they don't max out at 50, though, because you want to have some flexibility. You never know what's going to pop up. Uh, but one team, according to Cap Friendly, is maxed out 50 of 50 contracts used. Okay, this is interesting. I'm surprised it's only one team. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And only two at 49. Right. I'm trying to think of teams with lack of flexibility. And my first thing that comes to mind is Vegas. I know they have 26 guys on their roster, on their active roster. Yeah, I it think is, um, it is not Vegas. It is Vegas. OK, maybe Tampa. I feel like they would just calculate everything perfectly to the man. No, nope, both Vegas and Tampa are at 48 contracts. Oh, OK. Uh, this is going to be a weird one. Chicago is not Chicago. Okay. They're on the low end at 45. And and for okay. everybody, because this is the Kraken specific podcast, Kraken by far and away have the most uh, flexibility with only 33 players signed under contract. Oh, that's so not many. It is not a lot, but it makes sense. You know, they don't have a ton of prospects. They don't, they're not having to field a full AHL team right now. Right. Oh, Florida. Florida is not it. They oh. actually all fully 44. Very, very okay. low. Yeah. Think of them adding a bunch of guys around the deadline. Um, Hmm. I can I can give you well I could give you a hint that would probably pretty easily give give it away. All right, before, before I guess all thirty two teams, well <laughs> minus the ones we've already mentioned. Um. Well, here let me let me see if I could give you a better a better hint than than the one that'll just completely give it away. Uh. Yes, they are a division leading team. Calgary. No. Oh, okay. I'm going to get the last division leader <laughs> team here. Uh, Colorado. Nope. Okay, You've already guessed Florida, so. <laughs> All right. Then it is, uh, then it's, what is it? Um, is it Carolina? Lady? Yes, it is. It is the Carolina, Carolina Hurricanes. 50 of 50 contracts. Uh, I just found that very, very interesting. All right. Yeah, yeah that is interesting. Carolina. Yeah. And then the uh, these this is also interesting too. The two teams at forty nine contracts: the Los Angeles Kings and the New York Rangers. Hmm. Twenty fourteen. Endless. Yeah, Kings maybe make sense because they got so many young guys. They've been really stockpiling yeah. prospects and trying to. Rangers, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I no clue on that one. Um, and what's interesting, roster size wise, you mentioned Vegas does have twenty six players on the roster. Montreal twenty eight. <laughs> well, you know, there's no cap. Uh, I mean, sorry, there, not there's no cap. There's no uh, <laughs> roster. No, there, there's no roster limit. I mean, mm -hmm. as long as you fit under the cap is what I was going after. So you know, Montreal, they they've got so much. Uh, you know, so many guys out. You know, might as well. Yep. Yep. Arizona up at twenty seven. Uh, my favorite is looking at the. Uh, long-term IR, Vancouver and LA at seven. Both have seven players each long-term IR. That's incredible. I think Vegas Vegas acts like they're in a rough spot with four. Come on, get out of here. <laughs> Please, get out of here. Always if they're still anywhere close to Seattle. Get the heck out of here. <laughs> well, depends. If they've got three games against Vancouver coming up, so it depends how close you mean by close. Yeah, we'll get them out of there. They forfeit those three games. Let's go. Get it. Get it. <laughs> everybody's on board with that right only it was that easy i know um all right so i mean speaking of vegas we're gonna talk about the games and everything in a little bit but the one thing before we start getting into really what's the main topic which one way or another all seems to revolve around dave Haxtell. like just get ready everybody that's kind of gonna be what today is um 
got to talk Cole Lind. Finally yes. getting that first NHL goal. Oh my gosh, so, so happy for him. Absolutely. And you could tell the excitement just on his face in that celebration. You know, even though you're, you're just getting it within kind of two goals late in the game. Uh, you know, it, it was just kind of the moment transcended everything for him. And and I'm so glad that that was the case, too. I know some guys, you know, it, it might be a little bit of a downer that it, it didn't make more of a difference on the game. Um, but you could tell it was a long time coming for him. I, I, I know, like, turning to you sometimes, like, we were still surprised he didn't have his first NHL goal yet. He had so many good chances. He's played so well. Uh, and to see him get that one and uh, just really great. Uh, to see that and especially in the media availability afterwards to hear him talk about it too you know he said a lot of guys you know they say they black out but you know not me i remember every moment it was unreal uh and he was just you know grinning ear to ear the whole time yeah no it's it's one of those things and and i just did like the biggest pet peeve so many people have about me i did my yeah no thing but so sorry (laughs) i get that out of the way early in the podcast this time um, it's one of those things where, and this is, this would be like an Allison Lucan stat she'd have totally ready to go, but have you ever seen a player beat a goaltender, like beat goaltenders more often and just hit post when goal in? <laughs> Cause that, I felt like there's like four or five times this season where he'd beat a goalie clean and then just like post crossbar or, or just wide or something. And I would get all excited and ready to go. And then just be like, are you kidding me? Like again? How many times? <laughs> I know. It's crazy. It's like me in beer league. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's It was incredible. The other thing that's kind of incredible is, and maybe this is just because he's been up and down, up and down, only 12 games played with the Kraken so far this season for Cole Lynn. Like, only 12 games? Really? I know. It, it's really odd because it feels like he's been around so much more. Because mm-hmm. he has been. He's been around. He just hasn't been in the lineup. Um, again, which is why it's really important that he that he gets these opportunities gets to be in the lineup and uh, you know, even for tonight's game, it looks like he might be moved up to the second line uh, with Yanni Gord and uh, Victor Rask, which I'm really looking forward to see what he does there. Yeah. I think that'll be a a lot of fun. And uh, speaking of line changes kind of dovetails anew our first little topic here. Do you want to go ahead and introduce this one? Uh, Sure. Yeah. So some interesting line changes at morning skate, (laughs) Uh, some some different combinations uh, that that we saw after you know these last two Vegas games. So um, the D were all shuffled. I imagine the D pair is going to stay the same. Yeah. But the forward lines, you've got uh, Donato, Wenberg, and Eberly. So Ryan Donato moved up from the fourth line to the first line uh, with Wenberg and Eberly. So good opportunity for him there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I already mentioned, you know, Lind with Rask and Gord. But the other big change is you've got Jared McCann basically swapping spots with Ryan Donato. And uh, you've got fourth line Jared McCann this game. He's on a line with Riley Shan and Carson Kuhlman. So uh, this is definitely the first time we've seen that all season. Dylan, I, what what are you thinking about this? Uh, it, I saw does, you shake your head there. it doesn't make sense to me, especially because like through basically this entire season, the way Hackstall's been doing it, the first three lines are all about getting equal ice time. And the fourth line's the only one that's kind of been below that kind of around the 15 minute mark. And so to take the your 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 goal scoring leader and stick him on your fourth line, the only thing I can think of, and we'll get to this later mm-hmm. too, is that he hurt himself in that fight. Yeah, I mean, that was the first thing I thought when I saw him on the fourth line. I mean, after, of course, I did a double take and made sure that that's actually where he was. Um, yeah, I, I'm thinking maybe he he might have hurt his hand. Now, we saw it last night. You know, he put his hands up on the table and you could see that his right hand was, you know, very bruised. You know, it's this like dark purple, you know, mm-hmm. exactly you know, what you'd imagine uh, would happen if you have a guy punching a helmet a couple times with his bare hands. Um, and you know, he, he shrugged it off. He said his hand's good. He just called it, you know, paper cuts, but you know, it, it's definitely a possibility. And I'm very curious to see what McCann's ice time ends up being, because if he plays the, you know, eight, nine, 10 minutes, like the rest of the fourth liners, you know, and especially even strength, you've got to think something's wrong there because he played well, you know, to finish that game too. coming back from the fight. He played well, he got an assist, you know, on, on the goal there. Um, there's no real reason otherwise to to demote him like that. 
maybe it is an injury thing. Yeah, and I hope it isn't. And, you know, we'll see guys come back and play the rest of that game because you still got the adrenaline going from the fight and from the playing in the game. You get, you know, whatever numbing injection you're going to get for that moment and you go out there and before the swelling gets bad and, and all that stuff happens, you can finish the game. Um, but this is uh, it's the only thing I can think of and that just worries me and we'll get to why it'll especially piss me off if it's yeah. true later. And exactly. And another thing just worth mentioning, I think, too, especially if we see him get very limited ice time uh, with the in on the injury front, is you look at the Kraken's roster, they don't have any healthy substitutes. The only right. forward that they have, uh, you know, that's not dressed is Jaden Schwartz. And mm -hmm. he's still injured, uh, categorized as day to day. But Haxtell said the other day that it might turn into a week to week type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, that's as good as week to week for me. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got Hayden Fleury, who still is is injured and still day to day with an upper body injury. You know, it, and he played it forward one game this season. Don't necessarily want to put him there again. But uh, yeah, it's it's something to think about, too, where you don't really have someone who can just hop mm -hmm. in and, and take that spot. So maybe you just put McCann on the fourth line, limit his minutes and see what he can do. Yeah. See how you brought it back around to the whole contract thing. Only 33 co players under contract. That's the, <laughs> the that's the stuff you run into, you know. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so that's that's kind of what the lines are looking like. And important to note, we are recording this on Sunday afternoon pre Dallas game. All right, yes. so you are all listening to this with future knowledge of what this Dallas game looks like. For all we know, Jared McCann on the fourth line just feasts and has like four goals tonight. In <laughs> which case, awesome, great, I'll take it all day long. Um, but uh, you know, we will, we will see you and I, as of this moment, RJ, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. So that kind of also dovetails into a question we got on Twitter. Yes. And this is from Leanne on Twitter and they asked, this is my first year closely following hockey. What's the function of all the different lines and what determines who's in which line as a big baseball fan? I always know who's on first. Why do hockey starting lineups change every game? And uh, there were some replies there already talking about how Hextall has done a lot more shuffling of the lines this season than generally any NHL team will do throughout the course of a year, uh, as evidenced by what we were just talking about. It's all it's it's constantly in flux. Um, but basically, to, to make it as simple as possible, when it comes to your four forward lines, your top two lines are going to be generally your best scorers. Like that's, that's what you're doing. They're going to get the most ice time. You want to have, you know, your star center be on your first line because usually for most teams, and I kind of mentioned how the Kraken haven't done this. Most teams, first, second, third, fourth line, that's the order in which they're going to get the you know most to least ice time. You want your first center out there as much as possible um, because they're your best player. Generally, you want your best wingers out there, the you know, your best goal scorers, whatever it may be. Um, but things do get interesting with those bottom pairs, RJ, those those bottom six uh, group of forwards that you have. Do you want to kind of talk about what a checking line is and, and stuff? Yes. Um, so those bottom six, and they can kind of be deployed differently and used differently. Uh, talking about basically a, a checking line, and this is something that's kind of been a staple in NHL lineups for a long time where, you know, somewhere in your bottom two lines, you have what's called a, a checking line of guys that maybe don't score as much, but they kind of have more of a physical edge to them. They tend to hit a little bit more. Uh, you know, they, they're, you know, kind of referred to as grinders down low along the boards. They can kind of do that role for you. Oftentimes, if you have, you know, a particularly skilled checking line, they can match up against other teams' top lines with the objective of basically just shutting them down and making sure that nothing happens when they're on the ice, you know, freeing up your, your top two lines, your skilled lines to go feast against lesser competition. Uh, the checking line is typically uh, was thought of as kind of the third line, the, the way most coaches did it, uh, you know, generally in the past, but though, although recently in the last decade or so, the checking line has kind of moved to the fourth line because now you in the more skilled game today, you want three lines that can score. You want three skilled lines. You need that in order to keep up. The checking line has kind of been relegated to the fourth line. 
usually again this is all generally although i will say you know if you're following the kraken uh these roles are less defined on this mm -hmm. team than than on most teams and dave haxtell has said that himself in the past too he said you know i don't really put labels on it in quite the same way that you guys do i'm just looking for four lines that are that all kind of work together that have that chemistry that fit and just you like to get into rolling them and i think that's because the Kraken have this lack of star power that, uh, you know, means that guys can kind of be interchangeable and shuffle into these different roles because you don't have a bona fide first line center. You don't have an elite wing scoring winger. So these things shuffle around a lot more than maybe you'd otherwise see. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's kind of the thinking behind it. And so if you're looking at Jared McCann, oh, he's usually on the first line. Why is he on the fourth line now? Uh, you know, it, well, one, it could be the injury thing we talked about earlier, but two, it it just shuffles around and certainly the way Haxtell's looking at it he's just looking for four trios that that are going to work together yeah and you know we can get into in a sec the maybe benefits of letting a lineup kind of stay still for a little while let guys develop <laughs> chemistry with one another um we, i'm sure we'll we'll break that down in a second but yes that was a good breakdown of kind of what a checking line is the nhl has changed a lot in the last decade uh, everything has gotten a lot faster, a lot more skill-based. As you said, t there are teams now that can just run out, you know, a top nine that is all scorers, and they're just trying to create offense there. Um, a lot of times you'll see some teams where their checking line, despite still being called the checking line, it's really about just speed. Like, like mm -hmm. they're, they're more of an energy line. Just go out there and try to wear the other team out because you're just going to skate this puck up and down the ice, back and forth, and and that's just kind of your role. We've seen that from some teams, um, and uh, it's it, it can it can get very interesting. I, I will say I think the these days comes more into play in the playoffs. As you were saying, you can have a defensively focused line where the entire job is to play matchups in the in the postseason where you're just trying to shut down the opposing team's um, top scorers. I think the best recent example of this would be Tampa. Their last mm -hmm. couple of playoff runs, that was Yanni Gord's job. Like his job was to center a line. I forget they 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 shifted it um, between the two playoff series. But if you think of the players that they had, the Barkley Goudreaux's, uh, kind of doing more of an energy line type thing player right there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Blake Coleman, um, Yanni Gord, and then now they have you know Corey Perry out there, right? Like these are guys that can go out there and they're not necessarily going to get top six minutes on a team that's stacked like Tampa. Their job isn't to be the high flying goal scorer because you have so many other guys, but their job is to either shut down the opposing team's top player like Yanni Gord, or just go out there and create chaos for a little while, push, push some offense, get the other team pissed off a little like a Corey Perry or a Blake Coleman did times last season or Barkley Goudreau, right? Just try to, to upset what the other team is trying to do while still pushing your agenda. And it's, it's kind of like the best way I could describe it because, you know, they're, you're not expecting them to go out there and score or create any sort of consistent uh, offensive effort, but you're you're expecting them to go out there and just kind of stall the other team out. And so that's that's generally what the bottom six has been used for. And it, and it really comes into play in the postseason. It's unfortunate we won't get to see all that stuff from the Kraken this year in the postseason because playoff hockey can be so different from regular season hockey in that way um but uh but yeah that's that's kind of what it's like and then deep yeah. pairings generally it's just your best guys uh, higher they play more worse guys lower they play less like there there isn't really like a you know all oh, your third pairing defensemen are just like the hard heavy hitter kind of thing i don't really remember that ever being like a a thing I don't, I don't either. Really. It's just kind of exactly rules defined based on, you know, how much you trust them, how, how good they are. Essentially first pair is going to play big minutes. Second pair is going to play slightly less and third pair, you know, might, might even play quite sparingly if you don't really mm -hmm. trust them that much. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how it works. Yeah. We have again, seen playoff series where it's basically teams are running top four or five guys. Yeah. <laughs> and then there'll be like a six defense who plays like eight minutes a night while that top yep. guy's playing 32. It happens. Exactly. Yep. Um, but uh very, very good question. Very, yes. very happy to talk about stuff like that. 
So, Absolutely. Thank, thanks for the question, Leanne. And also, you know, if any of you listening have questions, like please reach out to us on social mm -hmm. media, you know, Twitter, Instagram, or in the YouTube comments down below, if you're watching this on YouTube, you know, we'd be happy to answer more of these questions. Uh, you know, we, we love to you know help people kind of learn the game. Yeah. I want to dovetail off of that, RJ, though, and talk about the constant line shuffling. We, we talked about like the most recent stuff that Hackstall was doing, but I do want to talk about it from a season long perspective as we're close to the end of the year now. I, I've never seen a, a team shuffle the lines as much as the Seattle Kraken have, uh, where to the point where you could not point to anybody and say they are the first line center or the second line center or the third line center, really. Mm -hmm. I guess Yanni Gord has kind of settled in as the second line center. That's been probably the most consistent thing we've had all season. Um, I, I don't quite understand the logic behind it. I got it at the beginning of the year. Because you have a bunch of guys who have never played together before. You had to kind of throw them together, see who's working well with who, see who's kind of hitting the ground running after a short training camp and all that kind of stuff. But to be this far into the season and you're still just constantly shifting lines and, you know, I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Yes, you lost a lot of people at the trade deadline, but still we haven't found consistent pairings, even on defense, just of, of two groups, two people sticking together for any length of time. No, it's true. And I, like you said, I understand at the beginning of the season, you want to throw whatever you can at the wall, see what sticks. Uh, but it, it feels like nothing really stuck. And, and the bits that did, you didn't stay with. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know, you know, you've got COVID that also had some people out of lineup. You've got the trade deadline. But it's not just a matter of, oh, you know, sometimes the lines are being shuffled. Like you said, I've never seen it to this extent on a team before. And, you know, we've we've watched hockey. We followed hockey for a long time. I don't think either of us can remember something like this. And mm -mm. Um, and, and I think uh, Allison pointed this out, uh, I think, just during a morning skate a few games ago. But it was the uh, the first Vegas game where uh, that was the third game in a row that the Kraken had, had the same forward lines. Uh, you know, so three games in a row did not change the lines. They were exactly what they were. And that was the first time all season that they had had three games in a row, the same forward lines. And, and you know, we're we're in we're in late March at that point. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's rare <laughs> that, that you see that. Um, yeah, there just has not been uh, much consistency in that regard. And, you know, when you're trying to build chemistry, especially when everyone's, you know, new on, on playing together for the first time on the same team. How are you supposed to do that when everything's changing like this? Right, exactly. I I don't understand the logic behind it. Uh, the continued deployment of it is the is the thing that's been surprising. Like I said, there there have been things in there. At the beginning of the year it makes sense to be doing that. First twenty games, I was going to give you. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, figure that out. Have guys changing around in practice game. You're trying just to see who's working together. Who has that instant chemistry where they can maybe make one play a game. Right. You're seeing, OK, there's something there. Let's stick those two guys together uh, for some length of time. And then we'll see if that can turn into three, four, five, six, ten plays a game that they're making. Right. As they get more comfortable with each other. Uh, that's that's the kind of thing that you're generally looking to do. But it never really seemed like Hackstall was looking for that. It was more just like, did you give me a goal? No putting you back in the blender you know what I mean like that was that was very much the way it was and and I don't know that that was necessarily the best approach to take with it um for as long as you did and, and again you got trade deadline guys moving right obviously Yanni Gord lost both his line mates he's gonna have to play with new people I'm not gonna get mad at you that you you're, why isn't Blackwell and Appleton there well they're not on the <laughs> team anymore obviously right but it's just one of those things even that that was like the most consistent line that we had seen for a very long time and think of how far into the season it took for us to get there and that mm -hmm. was after we knew that blackwell and gord had shown flashes together like when blackwell first came back into the lineup basically so yeah it's something we'd seen hints of for a while before he actually kind of stuck with it and that's so if i could may you know add another issue that i have is is that also when you did see maybe not a full line, but like kind of pairs of guys stick together. Um, it wasn't always based on like who was doing the best together. Um, you know, Eberly and Schwartz started out with really good chemistry together, but even when things went bad, they were still just kind of stapled to each other for, you know, longer than I would have left things. And, and, 
you know, even with all the line shuffling, certain guys like, you know, say a Jordan Eberle, even when he's not playing all that well, is just a fixture on the first line um, where the moves that he ha that Haxtell has made uh, aren't necessarily ones I would think are necessary all the time. But the ones that he hasn't, too, mm -hmm. uh, that would those were a lot of times areas where I think, OK, maybe you do want to shake something up here. Right. And I and I understand that to some regards when it comes to someone like Jordan Everly. So one of the more veteran guys on this team, uh, one of the guys with the larger contracts on the team, one of the guys uh, that has, you know, like I said, kind of the, the gravitas coming into it all. Uh, one of the faces of the franchise, you don't want to just be like, you're struggling, you're demoted to the third line kind of thing right away with them. You, they, you know, player like Everly has kind of earned the ability to try to work things out in that respect. But again, when you're, when you're shuffling everybody else around so much and when you're giving the top three lines essentially the same amount of ice time each night, then it's not really like you don't really have a first, second and third line. Like it's 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 symbolic then there's no right. there, there's nothing to it. So if you go ahead and put Everly on the quote unquote third line or whatever, it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, I don't think that you're, you know, making some sort of statement about how this player needs to really wake up or whatever, like like some other star players around the league when they get demoted from the top line. You know what I mean? When he's just going to go from playing 16 minutes a night to 15 and a half. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's not really a demotion. So I don't know. I agree with you. I think that there has there was some stuff done that felt more front office-y than coaching. In, mm -hmm. in that, you know, Eberle and Schwartz, all right, they both got A's on their chest. They both make over $5 million per year. They're both more veteran guys. Like, they just, they go together. Like, because that was just what we thought when, you know, they signed Schwartz and they pick Eberle. But if it's not working on the ice and you have three lines getting the same amount of ice time, you might as well move them around with everybody else. Yeah, agreed. I'm glad you brought up the whole front office type of stuff as far as, you know, well, this guy's under this contract. We have to you know, play him a certain way. Cause I think we're going to, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on too. Yeah. And you know what? I mean, we can, we can kind of get into that a little bit here, but um, Wenberg is like the one exception to that. Mm -hmm. Like, like big free agent, you know, they sign him. Francis talks about how he wants to get him in at the top six. Gord at the time was going to, we knew miss some time. So there was going to be that role. Everybody kind of had the expectation of McCann being up there and Gord. Those were going to be your top two centers. But Wenberg can, can maybe start the season up there and, and we'll see what happens. Um, they haven't had an issue moving Wenberg, pushing Wenberg down the lineup at all. No, <laughs> they season. certainly haven't. <laughs> and which, you know, I don't always have a problem with it. You know, I think a lot of times it has yeah, been just struggled. to give it up his plate. But yeah, uh, yeah cer certainly no issue there, at least. Yeah. So interesting that you kind of then see it on the other side. We saw it with um, Geo right? Mm -hmm. Gio is just kind of a staple. He was going to be top four, if not a top pairing defenseman each and every night. Permanent yep. and... fixture on that top unit power play, regardless of how it was going. Like again, yep. at some point you have to, t I get it that they're a veteran guy. It's the team captain, whatever. But at the end of the day, this is sports and sports is a results-based business. Everybody understands that. I know Hackstall understands that he's had other jobs before he's been fired before. That's just the way it is like for everybody at any level of the organization. So it's been very surprising. And I guess it speaks to maybe the level of job security that they've, they've made sure to instill in him about, mm -hmm. you know, him having this job long-term. But yep. uh, yeah. All right. Do you want, uh, we, we're, we're at a fork in the road here, RJ. We've got yes. two directions. <laughs> we got two directions we can take on this next bit. Um, do do you have a preference on where we go? You kind of know the two things that I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think... Which, you which know, rant do you want to hear from me first? I, I think... Let, let's start with um, the the Drieger and, and the, uh, you know, the sports psychologist thing. Because I think, you know, th that was a really interesting development, uh, mm -hmm. you know, th this week that we heard about. So uh, go, go ahead, Dylan. All right. So... 
unless you've been living under a rock, and I know the, those of you that listen to this podcast for the most part are pretty active on Twitter and active around the team, uh, you you all kind of know what's going on. Many of you are with us in the post game lives. We certainly talked about the goaltending change from game the first game against Vegas to the second game against Vegas. Uh, when when Drieger was taken out for Grubauer and the comments made at the time from Hackstall about wanting leadership from the position. And, you know, I've talked about how I felt like he probably meant communication and misspoke. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt there, but it, it was a rough thing to say uh, about Drieger. It kind of throws him under the bus for kind of no reason like yes you lost that first game against Vegas but essentially you lost it to nothing before the empty netter that's hardly a game that you generally pin on your goaltender (laughs) in situations like that but this came not long after we were starting to see Drieger a little bit more and Drieger's starting to look a lot better a lot of the fundamental portions of his game that were iffy earlier in the season his positioning his aggressiveness his rebound control was all starting to look so so much better and starting to look like the goaltender that we thought we were getting from florida way back at the expansion draft the one at the time of the expansion draft we assumed was going to be our starter um (laughs) and and he was asked about it and he talked about working with a sports psychologist and and how helpful that's been to him and getting back to his game and, and all of that stuff. And he is hardly the first player, certainly not the first goaltender around the NHL. Um, many have. Carter Hart has openly talked about this going back to his days of playing for the Canadian World Junior Team. Um, Peter Morazic has talked about this. Nathan McKinnon has talked about this. You can go and just look at Nathan McKinnon's point totals year over year and tell me when he started working with a sports psychologist. You can exactly pinpoint when that was in time uh, because it's a, it is a big deal and it's a big part of being a professional athlete is getting the mental component of the game, especially a position like goaltender and and or being like a franchise player like a Nathan McKinnon. I know there's been lots of talk about maybe Elias Pettersson trying this out in Vancouver, and I don't know if he is or not. Um, and and players like that that have that have struggled after hot starts to their careers and whatnot. And it got me thinking about things and how. The NHL is pretty far behind some of the other sports leagues when it comes to having uh, either sports psychologists around. Certainly, uh, you don't hear anything in the NHL about having a psychiatrist around. Uh, that's That certainly isn't there the way it is in some other sports. Or even just mental skills coaches. Like, it, it you know, yeah, that kind of falls under the, the psychology um, umbrella, but it's it, it's at least something. And so I did some some looking around at what the other sports leagues have going on. Uh, every NFL team has a sports psychologist, uh, like it not on payroll, but but kind of retained uh, mm-hmm. who will come in and, and work with the team through training camp, especially and then into the postseason. Um and then they're also available kind of on call if somebody needs them, sort of, so to speak. Um, the MLB you, more so focuses on the skills, the, the mental skills coaching aspect. 27 of the 30 MLB teams have a mental skills coach um, that their players have access to at any given time throughout the course of a season. And again, long, grueling season like that, that makes sense. Maybe more so than having like someone more like a therapist just because of how busy you are and how focused you have to be on, on everything day in, day out. Um, and then the NBA is really like the the leader when it comes to this stuff, where a couple of years ago when they launched their NBA Cares uh, initiative, tackling mental health within the sport. Um, and, you know, they already were kind of leading the way on this, but they finally went ahead and made it official. Every team is required to have a sports psychologist on payroll and in the team facilities. Like their office has to be in the facility so that the players can have really easy access to them at any given time. Um, I think that's a a brilliant thing to do. They also are required to have a a, um, psychiatrist kind of like on retainer with the team. Obviously not going to necessarily staff one of those full time. You probably don't need it, Um, but but they have someone there and that relationship is there and the players know who they are and can communicate and talk with them whenever they need to. In the NHL, I was trying to find teams that have uh, sports psychologists, and and basically none of them have one on on like staff. 
Um, several have them kind of on retainer and, and kind of similar to the NFL where they'll come in, talk to the team through training camp, make sure, get everybody kind of ready for the start of the season, and then come in at the beginning of the playoffs and help everybody get through the playoff run. Tampa uh, has been doing this for several years. The Maple Leafs have been doing this for several years, but it's remarkably a uh, few teams that have done this. Pittsburgh, it seems like, kind of initiated this back in the day with Crosby and Malkin after that first cup win, and then they started going through those lost years in Pittsburgh. Ray Shiro really started working on this kind of stuff um, is, is what I found out, and I thought that that was very interesting. But in, in a day and age where sports is such big business, where the NHL is a billion-dollar business, where all of this stuff is so important, and we now know more than ever that sports is, you know, they always joke 50 to 90% mental, but it's it's kind of true, right? If all it took was being 6'3", 225, and having a 75-mile-an-hour wrist shot to play in the NHL, you know what the NHL would look like? It would just be a bunch of guys that were 6'3", 225 with 75 mile an hour wrist shots, right? But the NHL doesn't look like that because that's not all it takes. It's not all just about the physical tools. Um, the fact that we have smaller players, the fact that we have bigger players, the fact that we have such a, a varying shapes and sizes in the NHL proves that it is a large part mental. You have to be able to process things at that speed. You have to be able to think about things. You have to be able to sit there and grind through an 82 game season, no matter how good or bad it is. And, and that takes a toll and the pressure takes a toll. And we've seen more and more players talk about this stuff recently about the, the toll that it's taken. Um, I think a good example would be Montreal looking at them last year. You had Jonathan Drouin stepping away and ultimately that, you know, coming out and talking about how that was related to anxiety and all the pressure he felt being in Montreal. Carey Price this season taking a step away after the playoff run last year just because of the mental toll that it took on him and his family. And so it makes no sense to me that you're going to invest all of this into your players and then kind of not take care of are, you know, the thing that could potentially be the biggest part of their game, which is their brain and their emotions and keeping them level headed and focused and able to deal with things over the course of, you know, a six, seven month season. I, I really don't understand why the NHL is, is falling so far behind here. I understand that they probably don't want to spend the money on it. That's always generally the owner's excuse when it comes to this stuff. Uh, but the bottom line is the, the owners can afford it. Um, we know they can. They know they can. I think the NHL needs to kind of start taking a look at some of these other leagues and, and start moving towards there. I am very happy, though, that Chris Trieger, to kind of bring it back around to the Kraken specific situation, that Chris Trieger talked about this, was open about it, because I think that that is very, very important. Uh, we've seen the Kraken try to be open about this stuff in the past with the Kraken talk stuff and whatnot um, from a couple months ago, right? Riley Shan coming out talking about his depression. I think that stuff is all great. I would have loved to then see, though, the franchise kind of maybe stand more behind these guys and, and, and it shouldn't be that Chris Drieger kind of has to go out and find this on his own. And I don't know that for sure. I don't, maybe the team did help him out there. But in a lot of these situations, from what I was reading in the NHL, these guys are contacting sports psychologists themselves. Their agents are doing it, setting it up for them. And they're essentially having to go to a third party. And I don't, I, that doesn't feel right to me. In 2022, when sports are as huge as it is, I don't feel like a player should ever have to leave their organization to find something to help them with something like this, or they shouldn't have to leave the NHL family at the very least. And yeah, so, especially, especially so, as, as holistic as the, you know, the treatment is for mm -hmm. players. I mean, you have basically an in-house team nutritionist and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's that sort of thing, taking care of the body that, you know, taking care of the mind is, is just as important, you know, maybe more important, like you were talking about. Um, and yeah, what we do know, Drieger was asked if he initiated, you know, the contact with the sports psychologist. He said, yes, he initiated it. I uh, don't know, you know, the, the details necessarily of, you mm -hmm. know, exactly who he worked with or, you know, how that was all set up. But, but he said he did initiate it. Yeah. So like I said, I don't want to like throw the crack and completely under the bus there. We don't know how involved they were in this. It could, they could be very involved in it and they're just not saying it, which is totally fine. Um, but, but based on some of the other examples that I was seeing in the, throughout the NHL, a lot of times it takes the player kind of stepping up and, and doing this on their own. And, um, it's, it's just one of those things that I'm, 
like I said, I'm just really kind of shocked that there are so many sports franchises and certainly the NHL almost as a whole is just they're really trying to pump the brakes on this for whatever reason. When the results speak for themselves, you look at anybody. I was reading going back to Lars Eller back in the day um, mm. and and him doing it and him turning it, it his uh, game around. Remember, I mean, you could again, one of those players, you can kind of pinpoint when this happened and all of a sudden getting a contract, paying him five million dollars a year. Right. Because he made that investment in figuring out his mental game and, and all that kind of stuff and but it shouldn't have to be an investment the players are making in themselves to me it seems like something that's that the team should want to invest in their players to then go and get the best out of those players try to go win stanley cups right um so it's it's an interesting one but i, I did want to bring that up very happy for drieger that he's getting that help i think it's been clear that it's been working for him um we're gonna see it tonight getting the start tonight against dallas i'm very happy about that getting him back out there um but, uh, but yeah, I just wanted to do a quick little rant there. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, well, if, if I can kind of tack on to the rant mm -hmm. just a little bit with, with one of my own here, and, you know, you can you kind of chime in once I bring this up. But you talked about kind of wanting to see the organization stand behind their player and, and help out with things like that. And, you know, and again, for all we know, the Kraken could have been very involved in Drieger finding this and, and, and all of that. But one area where I really would have liked to see you know, a particular member of the organization stand behind him a little bit more uh, is Dave Haxtell because mm -hmm. Drieger brought this up. And, and and by the way, Drieger brought it up unprompted too. He just, you know, mm -hmm. kind of asked him just, oh, how you've turned around your game. And, you know, and Drieger kind of volunteered this information to us, which I think is great that he brought it up. But then right after that, we asked uh, Dave Haxtell about, you know, what does that say about a guy, you know, a guy like Chris Drieger, who's goes out and, and initiates that and, and seeks some help and tries to turn around his game and, and does something like that to see a sports psychologist. And, you know, Haxtell's answer was basically, look, I'm not going to pat a guy on the back for just doing something that he should be doing anyway. Like that's his job. He should be doing whatever he can to make his game better. And I don't think he deserves, you know, any extra you know credit for just doing what he, what he should be doing anyway. And <laughs> I would have liked to see maybe a more positive response from, from Hackstall there. I understand, you know, the sentiment of obviously, yes, every player's job is to be trying to get better mm -hmm. every day and to do their best. I, I understand that. Um, but in this case, I think it's something that not a lot of players necessarily do for themselves, not something that a lot of players would, would initiate or, or, or feel comfortable initiating. Um, and yeah, I just, I was not happy with that answer. And he was actually asked again, I think the next day at practice about it too, from someone who I don't think was there, you know, the day the first question was asked. Uh, and he kind of repeated the same answer. He said, look, we're, you know, I'm not going to start patting guys on the back for doing what they're supposed to do. You know, if we, if we start patting guys on the back for doing their job, then we're going to be in a real bad spot. Uh, <laughs> was basically his answer. So I, I, I didn't like that. And I, I will give a little more context. I mean, it was kind of in this theme of, of, saying those sort of things like that those couple days he was also asked about jamie alexiak who had a, a good couple games you know recently that the players had brought up as well and he gave a similar answer about alexiak saying like look he needs to be playing like that all the time you know i mean it's great it's great to see him hitting it's great to see him using his body but he's got to be doing that all the time you talk about setting standards and where we want to be and making sure you've got consistent play and and again it's one thing for like jamie alexiak where okay yes using his body that's something that's Fairly simple and straightforward. Yes, you want to see him doing that every game. It's it's on ice play. I totally get that. You want to set high standards. Um, but for the Drieger thing, I, I I just don't think it it was right to kind of give that the same treatment. What do you think, Dylan? No, I a thousand percent agree. And it's it's again, it's very surprising that you would hear a coach say that. Or maybe it's not surprising, and I just have high <laughs> expectations when it comes to this stuff. Um, but yes, again, in, in some ways, it's it's almost admitting fault in a way, too. Like, well, I couldn't help him and my coaching staff couldn't help him. So he went out and found somebody who could help him. Right. Like that was his <laughs> that was his responsibility. Like, I, I don't again, like I said, he's going to a third party here. He's going outside the organization to do this. I don't know that you want to be like proud of that or just like reinforce like yeah no that's just the way it is if you want you know therapy or whatever you just got to get out of here like like it's just a weird stance to take um i don't i don't understand it and i really don't like that because like you said this is not an on ice performance thing 
Uh, I don't feel like he'd talk about this if it was a physical injury like rehab thing maybe he would but generally when coaches talk about a guy rehabbing an injury you talk about Brandon Tanev or or when um Jaden Schwartz is coming back and stuff right it wasn't just like well he's he's doing physical therapy that's his job like I'm not going to pat him on the back for working hard at trying to get healthy so he could play for us and help us win games like you don't say that no no coach says that I ever. can't think of the time where I've heard a coach you know talk about like you know, all the all the work he's putting into rehab what does that say about how hard a worker he is oh well no I'm not going to pat a guy on the back for doing you know that's his job is to rehab yeah you know, I've never heard that before right so to say it about somebody doing that to to for their for their mental game just doesn't make any sense to me either and it just isn't another unfortunate example of of kind of how far we have to go when it comes to this kind of stuff especially in the sport of hockey um but yeah i mean i don't know for also i guess when it came to Jaden schwartz the best we ever got was he touched ice so you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's just the way it is yeah, that that's been uh, a little tricky injury situation for sure, communication wise. If if I can add one more thing though, I mean, while we're while we're talking about Haxtell and that answer, um, it was just kind of confusing to me that he basically started with that a few days ago about wanting to you know set standards and be real strict on that, and you know we're again we're not going to pack guys in the back for doing what they should be doing. We need to play this way every single game, and we're not going to let them off the hook if they're not. Um, that needs to be the expectation. It's one thing if you're like a Daryl Sutter or a John Tortorella and, and you're kind of hard on your players like that and that's what the standard is. Um, but it was weird to me anyway to see that from Haxtell at all of a sudden because mm -hmm. I, I, my first thought was, okay, where was this in December when mm -hmm. the season was in the balance and, you, and you're on these eight-game losing streaks, nine-game losing streaks? Where was that? Because I don't remember any any talk like that you know, about guys, hey, they, you know, yeah, he had a good game, but he needs to play this way every game because we're still, mm -hmm. we're losing games. We, we need everyone to play like this. I don't remember that at all. Mm -mm. So I just, I don't know where this came from all of a sudden and just the, the timing, I don't know, it just seemed odd to me. It, the timing is extremely odd and, you know, your, your post-trade deadline, you've officially been eliminated from the playoffs. Like, what, the whole, all you're playing for at this point is, is pride and, and to some extent, and I talked about this on the last post game show, you, you need to be playing to set the stage for what you want to do next year. Now's the time to go ahead and work at NHL game speed on things that you want to potentially try next off season to, to implement bef going into next season. Now is the time for the goaltenders to start focusing on those fundamentals, right? You had a bad season. Both of them had had have had bad seasons. We all know this. I think they would acknowledge it. Like it's, it's kind of, it's just fact, right? Grubauer, bad season. Drieger, bad season. It's just the way it is. Now is the time to kind of be doing what Drieger is doing, which is let me go back to fundamentals. Let me focus on getting that stuff right. So I have a solid foundation to go into this off season with that. I can then build off of come next training camp going into next season. Let me make sure that I can get back and center myself so that I can do all that stuff while I still have some games that I can work on that kind of thing. And really the whole team should be doing that. Jordan Everly shouldn't be focused on really doing anything. It should just be about like figuring out goal scoring again, because that's what we're going to need from him next year. Like, yes, it would be great if he back checked a little better, right? I think we could all acknowledge that. And that's something that he can work on too. But when it comes to a lot of what these players need to focus on, for the young players, it's just about getting used to playing at, at this speed. When Beneers comes in, all you want him focusing on is getting used to the routine of being an NHL pro and getting used to the speed of the game. Because those are the things that if he can get those two things down going into the next season, it'll then allow him to work on the, the little parts of his game that are going to make him a potential superstar. Right. You would never expect him to come in and be like, OK, you're going to be our third line center now and I need you to be on the checking line and you better shut down, you know, whoever it is we're playing against. Like you don't do that with Beneers or a young guy coming in. And after the way this season has gone, you shouldn't be doing that with any of the veterans either. You know what I mean? You need to get them just kind of ready to go so that they can enter this off season with a place to work and build better for next year. Yeah, agreed. And, and you know, kind of speaking that way, you know, in the media, it, it's a button you can press. It's a very mm -hmm. important 
you know button a very important tool to have in your in your tool shed but generally you only want to kind of press that button when you need when when you're hoping to get wins out of it and that's what's really important uh and we're we're kind of past that at this point this season yeah i was gonna say are we still sitting at 20 wins on the, uh, on the button 21 21 yeah i thought so we yeah had more. 68 games into a season in which you've only won 21 games it's not really the time to be doing that stuff <laughs> just at least traditionally I, just, you know, I, I don't know uh it feels a little off all right um i'm still uh kind of catching my breath here for my big rant rj do you want to kind of <laughs> get into uh these these vegas games and and the other stuff we wanted to talk about here yeah for sure i mean you know let's get into the two vegas games those are the most recent ones you know both of them at climate pledge arena uh neither of them went too well uh you've got the first game uh Kraken played a good first period uh got absolutely dominated in the second go behind and in the third period Vegas just shut everything down I mean we, we've seen this from Peter DeBoer teams it, one of the things they do so well if you spot them a lead they can just muck up the neutral zone and, and there's no chance you get past I think the Kraken had 0. 0.06 expected goals in the third period of that game while trailing I mean that's Crazy. insane yeah yeah so that was the first game. Uh, you know, they, they score one, but it's overturned because of offsides. Logan Thompson ends up uh, getting the shutout. Rough game there. Uh, I, anything to add about that game before you go on to the second one? No. It was also the game I was most out of it with my fever and everything. So. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's let's move on uh, to the second Vegas game because I think there's some more interesting things to talk about mm -hmm. there. Um, you know, it, it uh, the start wasn't quite as good uh, as... as the first game, um, it uh, it was actually a lot high, higher scoring by the end of it than it really was. I think 5-2 with all the empty net goals. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, Kraken still went down 3 nothing. You know, the, the whole goalie leadership thing didn't exactly... We got him into the same hole, but quicker. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the D-zone turnovers were still there. The mental errors were still there. You know, they, they did kind of claw back and get one you know a couple goals but they were both once the game was out of hand and i think in that game really the most important thing we saw is that the frustration was boiling over and mm -hmm. frustration was a word that was used a lot uh by you know by the players by you know by by the coach yeah i mean and and it kind of uh manifested itself in jared mccann and yanni gord both fighting and you you don't see that a lot from them mm -hmm. uh but most notably, you had Jared McCann dropping the gloves to try and get the team, you know, give him a spark, motivate them. But really, as he said, it was just frustration boiling over at losing puck battles and not doing the right things. And uh, ultimately, you know, he, to, we can argue to what extent. I don't think we truly know, but he heard his hand in the process, too. Yeah. And um, this one was frustrating for me. I understand where the players are coming from, like where McCann's coming from when he talks about that stuff and how frustrating it was. Uh, we've talked a lot in the post game for it about, you know, the, the, whatchamacallit, what the game to game changes. What's the word for that? Why am I spacing on this? Wait, the, you know, the changes the, you make from one game to the next to, to, to adjustments. Adjustments. Thank you. There you go. The adjustments weren't <laughs> there at all. Like, I think mm -hmm. the biggest adjustment was they were going to try to be more physical and that was going to somehow slow down the Golden Knights, but they just ended up, like, missing checks and just sending more on-man rushes for the, right. for Vegas. And, and the physicality, it, it was there. You could tell that was something they made an effort mm -hmm. to work on, but it maybe lasted the first 10 minutes of the game, yeah. if that. Right, because it wasn't the really... Message away. Yeah, and it wasn't really working when you were doing it anyway. Like, the adjustments you needed to make were how to be better getting through the neutral zone yourself and how to slow them down through the neutral zone. Like that's what was going to, that's what killed you. And that's what especially killed you in the second game. Um, and so th that was kind of where the adjustment needed to be and it wasn't there. And I think that kind of set the stage for what was going to be a frustrating game. Like the first 10 minutes, you just knew this game was going to be, you know, one. And, um, and so I understand that, but it, this has been another complaint I've had a couple times throughout the season with Hackstall, but this one was the clearest example. When Vegas scored their second goal, I tweeted, change your goalie right now. Try to wake up this team because right now you're playing terrible. 
The, the defense is a disaster. Uh, the transitions are a nightmare. You need to wake up this team and you need to just somehow try to spark them, reset them. Drieger had been playing well. He played well that previous game. Go ahead, get him back in there. You got to make that change. Almost before I could finish tweeting that, Vegas scores again. Now it's 3 nothing. And I'm like, you absolutely need to do something if you're the coach in this situation. And I think a lot of coaches would do something in that situation. This is your second game against division opponent. You you know what I mean? Like you're trying to to do something. Both of these goals have been really bad goals. Like you either have the defense completely mucking it up, the Alexiak and Susie on the previous on the first of those two, or you just have literally you just have Theodore walk in down the slot completely untouched, able to pick whatever corner he wants against Grubauer. Like these are not it's not like a Grubauer thing, you gotta get him out of there. This is your team is literally not playing NHL caliber hockey right now and you need to do something about it. And he didn't and he and he hasn't really throughout the season. I can only think of a handful of times, and they were very early on in the season, in which Hackstall has made an in-game change like that, an in-game in goaltending change. And so I don't know if he just doesn't really believe in it, but the bottom line is when you're an NHL coach, this isn't football where you're calling every play, right? Your job as an NHL coach is to, yeah, it's to manage the lines and manage maybe line um, pairing and, and whatever you want to you do, line matching if it's the postseason, right, whatever. But it's also to manage the emotions and the energy level of your team. And that was a clear example of a time where you could tell that this was not going to fix itself. You had to, somebody had to do something to fix it. And um, I, I think it's on the coach to try something first before a player goes out there and does something and takes a horrible trade. McCann fighting, I forgot who he fighted, uh, Amadio. Like, yeah, Matt, yeah. That, is, that is a terrible trade for the Kraken to be making, especially when you're down three, nothing, you kind of want your best goal scorer out there. And then, you know, fighting these days, you and I talked about with the visors and the helmets and everything, you end up punching helmet and visor like 95% of the time. You're not actually punching a, a, another human being, um, which, you know, it's, it's a, all a fiasco. <laughs> all fighting is a fiasco, um, which means you're just punching hard, oddly shaped plastic with edges. Yep. Like, don't do that to your top goal scorer's hands. We don't want that. And then he goes down the locker room and I'm just like, why is this should not be on McCann? Like there were, there were options available for this team and it should not have devolved into what it devolved into. Yeah. Agreed. And there's a lot of elements to it. I, I think, you know, the goalie change was something certainly that Haxtell could have done. I think he kind of, you know, pushed himself into a corner there, given his comments about needing mm -hmm. leadership in the position. I felt like, you know, normally you might want to make that goalie change, but given what he had said earlier in the day, I felt like all of a sudden he wasn't in a position where he could do that. And he kind of put himself there. Uh, and then once you don't, you know, now you're relying on, you know, a player to go to go fight and and do something that's going to change the momentum. And Haxtell after the game did say he's like, you know, I thought we put on a really good push. I thought it did give us some energy that fight. Um, and and, you know, credit to McCann, I guess, for being courageous enough to, to drop the gloves there. Like it's not an easy thing to do, uh, you know, to, to try and get your team going. And, you know, I'm sure it was you know more born out of frustration than mm -hmm. being like, look, I got to get the team going, but still, um, you know, you, what does it say about your team and, and where you are in the personnel when Jared McCann of all people has to be the guy to do this? Mm -hmm. I, he should be the last guy who should, who should have to do this. Somebody is got if if you've decided okay look we need to fight to wake us up. Mm -hmm. Somebody else. Right. I don't care who but somebody else has to be the one to step up and do that. You cannot let Jared McCann, your leading scorer, go punch, you know, an opponent's helmet with his bare hands and and you see the results. I mean, you know, they were it was all bruised up. It's not good. You even if he escaped any kind of major injury you know, playing that game, it's risky. I mean, we just saw what last week, Nathan McKinnon get into a fight mm -hmm. and now he's got, you know, a hand. He, did he come back from that? I think he's already came back and played, but they said they were worried about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's a dangerous game. We've seen it happen too many times. And, and McCann's the guy the Kraken can least afford mm -hmm. to lose right now. Um, and and it, it also sets up something for this off season where I think you have to bring in someone who is willing to do that. That's got to be an off-season need. In addition to the scoring winger, in addition to the maybe the right-handed shooting defenseman who can, you know, quarterback a power play, 
you need to get someone in the bottom six who's who's willing to do that. You know, Lausanne w- wasn't afraid to drop the gloves early in the season. He's gone. You need but, someone who can fill that spot. They have Tanev. Like, Tanev would do that. That's true. Right? That's um, true. But, it, again, he's just he's been out. They didn't have anybody. Um, but, but you know what? You had guys. Victor Rass can do that. Like, like Victor Rass could do that. And guess what? He's playing for an NHL gig right now. Tell me he wouldn't be willing to go out there and do that for his new teammates if you asked him to. Like, again, if you even if you don't like this is it is it's not like it's never been done before where a coach has approached a player and said, hey, can you go out there and do something for us? Lay a big hit, get into a fight, do something just to get this team going for us. You know what yeah, I mean? Like Tom. that happens all the time. <laughs> yep. Do that. Go to him. Go to Riley Shahan. You know what I mean? Like you, you pick somebody like that who's, you know, yeah, you're not probably going to go up to a, maybe a Morgan Geeky. I don't know how skilled he is at something like that. You don't want a, you don't want to pick somebody who's going to go and get embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because uh, that, that will not have the, the positive effect. But you got, you know, Alexiak has not been afraid to drop the gloves many times this season, and he just punishes guys. Like, yeah. I don't know. There was, there was options on the table for Haxtell there beyond just making the goaltending change, even if the goaltending change would have been the best idea. Because, um, <laughs> again, I don't, I, I don't want to be like, yes, we need to encourage all these guys to go potentially hurt their hands and give themselves CTE. Like, obviously, <laughs> we don't want to, you know what I mean? Like, it becomes this sticky, weird situation. But that's that's what being an NHL head coach is is being put into those situations where you're managing emotion, you're managing energy level um, more so than you're managing. You know, you're not a baseball manager. You're not trying to figure out which reliever to bring in against what hitter. Like, that doesn't exist in hockey. It, that So it's this is what, you know, you want your coach there for, is these moments to turn those kinds of games around where it's halfway through the game and you're down 3 nothing. Can we come back? Or can mm-hmm. we at least come back enough that we can set the stage going into the next game where we're going to like roll over whatever poor team has to face us next. And that's what the great NHL coaches do. And I don't feel that Hackstall did any of that. Yeah. Well said. In addition to not making the adjustments game to game, that too was also pretty rough. Yeah. And, and that was tough to see also, especially after I thought a lot of good adjustments were made in between mm-hmm. the two LA games. Yeah. And I think we were all kind of hoping to see that again. Like, Oh look, you know, same opponent back to back again, you know, even though they lost the first one and looked really bad. You know, there's hope for the second one because look, they just did it. Yep. And then no. Yeah. So that's uh I think that's gonna do it for this episode of the of the Deep Dive Podcast. Yeah, sorry to end it on uh you know, on, on kind of such I a know. depressing note here. You know, and I'm sure because we've done this, the Kraken will go and just beat the stars, you know, five nothing, it'll look for great. Sure. You know, Krieger gets the shutout, yeah. all that. Um, and then you'll be listening to this tomorrow, like, what are these guys talking about? Uh, I think there was enough frustration from this past week that everybody will be there. And, you know, I, I don't like kind of dumping on any one person. Like, like I don't <laughs> like dumping on Haxtell kind of as much as we have in this one. But it was just kind of a week, both from the on ice perspective and from the comments, sec- you know, perspective. Like, it was just all there. And it, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's it's there. And again, this is sports. You're a public figure. So the things you say matter. It's just the way it is. The same for you and I, RJ, right? We say the wrong thing here. People are going to get on us. That's what we're, that's the risk you take. And, um, and like I said, sports at the end of the day, results-based business. It's an entertainment business. Entertainment's based off of results. People only want to watch good things. That's why nobody is out seeing Morbius right now. It (laughs) doesn't seem like a good thing. So um, with that, I think we can go ahead and end this episode of the Deep Dive Podcast. Thanks, everybody, for joining us this week, and we will see you all next time. Bye.